We're going to be talking to you about the role of spirometry in diagnosing asthma and COPD. Um, I'm just going to give you a little bit of an overview about the background, about why we should be doing lung function and, and really uh, what is it about lung function and, and how can it help uh, in diagnosing and managing chronic lung diseases. And then after that I'll be taking you through a series of steps um, to highlight the key issues that you need to be thinking about if you're doing spirometry to ensure that the measurements that you might get with this lung function technique are as high a quality as possible so that the GPs or physicians that you're working with know that they're getting appropriate high quality information with, which they can then use uh, in their patients. So just a brief overview, uh, so what is asthma? So the Australian Asthma Handbook um, was recently re-released um, and you can find this online if you do a search for Australian Asthma Handbook through Google or, or whatever you'll find out, um, that publication there. It's an excellent online resource that covers all aspects of diagnosing and managing asthma in both children and adults um, and really is in a, a very easy to digestible format, um, giving you key recommendations that you can then delve down into more details as they may be appropriate or, or you want to chase them. Um, so, the, so if you think about it, in clinical practice, asthma is defined by the presence of both of these things, excessive variation in lung function, so that is it changes from one day to the next or one week to the next, and respiratory symptoms that vary over time. And at any one time, they may be present or absent. Untreated asthma, or out of asthma that may be out of control, is usually characterized by chronic inflammation um, and airway hyperresponsiveness. Now, by airway hyperresponsiveness, I mean airway reactivity, so that's where the airways are constricting when they are exposed to some form of trigger. And as you know, triggers can include things like exercise, allergens, grasses, pollens, um, house dust mite, cats, and so on. Or for some people, it may be occupational exposures such as dust or chemicals at work, uh, and, uh, and obviously another one, um, and particularly as it relates to COPD, um, is cigarettes or secondhand cigarette smoke. So this is this comes directly from the um, Asthma Management Handbook and really what I would like to highlight here that if for you to get to a diagnosis of asthma um, and hopefully this mouse will work so that you'll see that you have a patient uh, reporting some kind of symptoms that might be suggestive of asthma but at this point these are just symptoms. There will be some kind of history and physical examination uh, and all of you would be familiar with how that might work and, and it may be that after that examination um, that the suspicion is that there is not asthma. However, before you can actually get to a diagnosis of asthma, you'll note that we have to pass through this box that talks about spirometry and we talk about getting FUV1 or one of the lung function measures and I'll talk about this in more detail in a moment but we look at FUV1 both before and after bronchodilators. And so it's this key point that I'd like you just to keep in mind as we're going through the presentation today. But it's only after you have patient symptoms, history, physical examination and lung function that you can truly uh, be confident that the diagnosis of asthma is going, uh, can be given. So what about COPD? So chronic obstructive pulmonary uh, disease. Uh, so this is from the COPDX guidelines uh, and you can see the URL link there at the bottom and once again it has an extensive range of information there for health professionals on diagnosis and management of COPD. And you can see here that for COP diagnosis, and this comes straight from the West uh, website, requires a demonstration of airflow limitation that is not fully reversible. So once again, just keep that in mind. So you need to have some measurement of, of some assessment of airflow limitation, and you need to know that they're not responding to bronchodilators. And so 
And uh, this, the, these indications for spirometry, as I've listed here, come directly from these guidelines that are specifically targeted at the primary care environment. Indications for doing lung function in a patient may be that they've got breathlessness that seems inappropriate, uh, in particular for COPD, that they've got chronic or intermittent uh, cough, frequent or unusual sputum production, so they're producing phlegm when they haven't had a cold and recently um, they're getting uh, recurrent and relapsing bronchitis, and importantly for COPD, that they have risk factors that, that include smoking, occupational exposure, and so on. We do know that a family history of COPD is a very strong risk factor for COPD uh, in individuals. However, you don't have to have a family history of COPD to have COPD yourself. So here we have two quite different chronic diseases. They have very common symptoms. The patient history may well be the same. As you can uh, no doubt think, you will have seen patients 40, 50 years old, for example, reporting um, shortness of breath, chest tightness, perhaps difficulty uh, exercising. They may have cough or no cough. Uh, some of them may have smoked. The question is, does this patient have asthma or does this patient have COPD? And really, the only way you can tease them out is by starting to get objective measures. Uh, one of the objective measures that you can get is, is lung function. So what is spirometry? Um, so what I'm going to run through now is just a series of background talking to you about what spirometry is so that you have a, a good understanding of, of how it can work. All of this is specifically targeted at the primary care environment. Uh, so I've been doing lung function for 20 something years now. Uh, I apologise in advance. At some point I know I'm going to use some jargon and acronyms. Uh, and so I'm just going to briefly touch on that now so that if I do forget and start abbreviating, you've got some idea about what I'm talking about. So I'm sure many, many of you will at some point will have seen a flow volume curve from spirometry, even, even if only in a patient's medical charts. So that the way that you usually see that plotted is that you'll have uh, flow on the, on the vertical axis and volume on the horizontal axis and what you'll see is the patient's ability to blow as hard as they can to their peak expiratory flow so after they've taken a big breath they're really blasting out and then as their, as their lungs start to empty you'll see the flow, flow volume curve slowly uh, decrease down to when they get to zero flow so that's when they have no air left in their lungs this point is their forced vital capacity, so that's the maximum volume that they can expire. Um, that, that that can expire. The other markers that we look at are the forced expiratory volume in one second. So that's the total amount of air that they can blow out as hard as they can in the first second. Um, and then we have peak expiratory flow. The other thing that you might see mentioned is the forced expiratory flow between 25 and 75. And this is, in effect, the slope of this curve. And it's the, the average flow, so the speed of the air, um, between 25% and 75% the forced vital capacity. The key things that you need to remember in terms of diagnosis and management of both asthma and COPD is not so much peak flow, not so much FE, uh, the forced expiratory flows, but the FEV1 and the forced vital capacity and the ratio of those two. So you'll often see people talking about the FEV1 to FVC ratio. So if you're doing if you have a patient coming in who you suspect who may have asthma and COPD and remembering what I've just shown you about the uh, diagnosis guidelines for both of those, you need to be able to do spirometry in them. If you have reliable equipment uh, and you have trained staff, spirometry can and is performed in primary care every day both in Australia and, and internationally. There is nothing about lung function that precludes um, practice nurses in a GP clinic or in a, a regional general hospital or similar or even for example in a pharmacy that is appropriately um, set up 
to be able to do spirometry in patients every day of the week. It does require you to have the right equipment. It means that you have to know that that equipment is working appropriately and it's important that you have staff who are trained in, in knowing how to do good lung function but also in recognising when the lung function is acceptable or not so that the reports can be appropriately uh, documented as such. What I'm going to touch on today is really the key issues that you need to focus on. Um, if you are interested in doing more detailed training about lung function, um, then you can contact the Asthma Foundation and there is the provision for more detailed training uh, if you're interested in that and if others in your um, healthcare area are interested. So before you make a diagnosis of asthma, uh, then you need to confirm that the FUV1 FVC ratio is reduced. So that is that it has a lower, it's below the lower limit of normal. And this is what we mean when we're talking about airflow limitation. Um, and particularly for asthma, you also need to know that the FUV1 is lower than predicted. And we'll talk about that a little bit more later. So one of the things you would have noticed is when we talk about asthma, we talk about lung function and airflow limitation that is reversible for asthma. And for COPD, you have to demonstrate that the airflow limitation isn't reversible. That is, after giving bronchodilators, it doesn't change. That means that you can't only do baseline lung function. You have to do both before and after spirometry to be certain uh, of your results and of your diagnosis. So the way you can do this is to do your normal lung function. Um, you can then, and then the um, standard international practice is to give 400 micrograms of salbutamol or any uh, fast-acting reliever medication um, using, uh, if you're using salbutamol, a pressurised meter dose inhaler and a spacer. Obviously, uh, if you're using dry powder inhalers, you don't need the spacer. Um, and then you wait for a minimum of 15 minutes before reassessing their lung function. A, bron a significant bronchodilator response is considered to occur if FUV1 increases by more than 200 mils, so that, for example, the FUV1 increased from 3.2 litres to 3.4 litres, and they have a response of more than 12% of baseline. Nearly every modern lung function uh, equipment will actually calculate this for you, uh, and so you don't have to do the maths in your head, you really just need to look at the numbers and, and it will flag that for you. So some points to remember just before we go on is that a failure to demonstrate reversible limitation um, after bronchodilator may not exclude asthma. So for example, if your patient is also taking preventer medications uh, and their asthma is well controlled, then they may not have a bronchodilator response. Um, you may also have patients who have preloaded with Ventolin in the car park, for example, because they want to come in and be, you know, all well for you. Uh, and so we, anecdotally, we often, you know, if you walk through the car park before asthma clinics, they're all out there having their puffers before they come in so that they sound pretty good. Um, Non-reversible airflow limitation may mean that they have COPD. Um, having a bronchodilator response doesn't prove that they have asthma, but if you have the other clinical signs and symptoms, may be highly suggestive of asthma. Um, and you really need to look at the pattern of symptoms and other clinical features to be sure. Now clearly that is the role of the physician or the GP or whoever it is that's managing that patient. In the context of um, primary care environment or, or hospital outside of the specialist environment, your role is to make sure that the lung function measurements are as accurate as possible. So if you're managing, if you have patients where you're managing asthma or you're thinking about how do we need to set up lung function so we can manage our patients with asthma, this is, these are the recommendations about how often you would be making these measurements. So you would do spirometry when the patients are first diagnosed. Um, again, three to six months later when the symptoms are stabilised uh, and the patient is on some kind of management protocol. Um, and then you would be doing, um, once again, spirometry before and after bronchodilators. A useful thing to consider is getting the patients to do, to 
apply their own to give the bronchodilator to themselves. This gives you the opportunity to make sure that they're using their inhalers properly uh, and just to do a short education session with them about using their um, inhalers if you think that that could be, if that requires optimization. And then you're then looking at making lung function measurements um, when you're assessing future risk, if there's been a significant um, exacerbation or flare-up recently, maybe to monitor the response if, if the doctor looking after the patient has, has changed their treatments. And then if all of those other things are fine, probably every one to two years, just to make sure that everything's going along. Okay. Um, if you have patients with severe asthma, you should really be courting spirometry every, every visit. As you know, there are some people out there who have very poor recognition of their symptoms uh, and who may not be reporting any specific symptoms. They might say, yes, I'm fine, I haven't had any wheeze, I haven't had any cough, I don't get breathless when I exercise. But when you dig down into the history, you, you suspect that those symptoms are occurring. And in those patients, it's a good idea to do spirometry uh, at every visit, just to be sure. So a quick guide to doing spirometry. So you need to get the patient to take a really big breath into total lung capacity. If they're not at total lung capacity, everything you measure after that will be reduced. So if, for example, I inhale to 80% of my lung capacity and then I do a perfect blow out again, the numbers that will come out from that lung function, the, the flow volume curve will look perfect, but the numbers that you will get will be 80% of my maximum. And so it's important to look at the patient not only when they're doing the, the, the blow, but also beforehand. Are they taking a really big breath in? then you need them to do a maximal exhalation all the way to residual volume. Now, it's really important to recognise that the FEV1, the forced expiratory volume in one second, is only valid if they're blowing as hard as they can. And the forced vital capacity is only valid if they blow all the way out to residual volume and they have no air left in their lungs. If you don't achieve those things, then the spirometry may not be um, usable, and we'll talk about that a little bit more later. So you can go online uh, and look at the guidelines associated with spirometry, and I'll put the URL up here. These documents uh, in there are really targeted at um, tertiary respiratory laboratories and, and tertiary specialists. However, they're a good resource to have around, so if you have a query about one specific aspect, you can um, look at that specific bit. Um, but the central goals there are really to improve performance, decrease the variability of testing, and standardise how the lung function tests, how the spirometry is interpreted. So when you're looking at flow volume loops, what you're really looking at is the maximum flow that you can achieve at any lung volume. So the peak expiratory flow is the maximum flow you can achieve from at highest lung volume. If you do blow all the way out to residual volume, then the, the longer you blow, the lower the flow gets because the respiratory muscles are getting um, are contracting into your lungs and so you can't blow as fast anymore because there's not as much to blow out. You need to be able to assess whether the patient is doing a maximal effort and whether they're and whether they're cooperating or not. And a good example for cooperation might be children who are six or seven years old. They might be cooperating or doing a maximal effort, but their cooperation with the test may not be perfect. And so you've got to try to work out is so they may be blowing really hard at the beginning and giving you a perfect peak expiratory flow, but not blowing all the way down to residual volume. Or they might be blowing for a really long time, but not blowing as hard as they can. And it's up to you to give them some personalised feedback to help them um, do both parts of that test. Um, as we've talked about, you can use it to assess obstruction, so asthma and COPD. You can also look at to uh, it can also be used to help um, identify if there's a reduction in lung volumes due to a chest wall problem, so scoliosis is a good example, or uh, interstitial lung disease or some other fibrosis. This will be much less common uh, in primary care uh, and the sort of peripheral regional uh, hospital environment, but of course these patients will all present somewhere first. 
Uh, and so it's about recognising that these patterns may occur, although I'm not going to touch too much on those today. So simple guide to doing perfect spirometry. Uh, like everything else, it comes in a nice flowchart. And um, I guess what I'd like to highlight for you is that really you have to know that your equipment is working and you have to do quality control. So just like any other instrument in the hospital environment, unless you check to make sure that it's working properly um, and you somehow assess that, you really don't know whether you should be using it in terms of patients. So in terms of quality control, um, Every spirometer that you get will have some kind of preventative maintenance that will come in the owner's manual and usually they're fairly simple and you can just uh, follow those. Some pieces of spirometry or lung function equipment do require you to calibrate it before every use. This process will be described in the owner's manual and it is different for every piece of equipment. Um, but if your equipment tells you that it needs to be calibrated, it's essential that you do that before you make measurements because if you don't, it may mean that you tell a patient that their lung function is, for example, three litres, when in fact it's four. That may mean that, or may lead to, inappropriate diagnosis or management. Some equipment doesn't require you to calibrate it, and it will always tell you that very clearly. It is highly recommended that you do a verification. So that's effectively you saying, the equipment expects to see three litres and if I use some kind of system and I give it three litres that it tells me that it's seen three litres. So the ways, you, the ways you can do that are is to buy a calibration syringe and really they're just a standardised uh, usually three litre syringe you can connect it to the lung to your spirometer, uh, move the air in and out and it should measure three litres. The other way you can do it is using one or two staff who are always around, uh, who don't have asthma or any other respiratory problem. You can do their lung function uh, and you do it every day for a couple of weeks and from that you'll know what their average lung function is and you can develop a biological, what's called a biological control program that will at least tell you that if your lung function is three today and it's three tomorrow, if I measure you again next week, it will be three. And that will give you some confidence um, that the equipment that you're using is working properly. If you have a lung function uh, system in your own clinics and you're interested in, in knowing how you could develop uh, and do this quality control type of program, you can email the Asthma Foundation, get in contact with Russell, uh, and I'd be glad to um, work with you to, uh, to develop a program that suits your own local environment. So you've now got, uh, you've done your equipment quality control, you know that your spirometer is working properly, so you need to get ready for the patient. So depending on what your doctor has requested, you may, the patient may be required to withhold treatment. If you're going to assess bronchodilators, you would usually ask all patients to withhold any uh, reliever medication for a minimum of uh, 4 to 12 hours, and that will depend, of course, on what treatments they're on. If they're only on short-acting bronchodilators, 4 hours uh, is enough. If they're on long-acting bronchodilators, you'll need to withhold treatment for a minimum of 12 hours. This is so that you know that when you're measuring that response to vents or bronchodilators, that they aren't already at their best lung function because uh, they still have relievers on board. You need to obtain a general history if you've never seen them before. It's absolutely critical that you measure their height in particular uh, very accurately. You need to know their age. Uh, weight you would be recording for normal clinical purposes anyway, although it's not important for the lung function per se. You need to know whether the patient uh, has the capacity to undergo the lung function test because it requires active patient cooperation. Some individuals, for example, who have uh, very young children, uh, very old uh, adults, or other individuals who may have um, some form of cognitive impairment or intellectual disability may have problems with the lung function test and you might need to uh, work out whether that applies for you. And then obviously you need to have the appropriate equipment and supplies. So in terms of test procedure, you want to explain uh, the test to the patient. Tell them that they're going to be blowing out through the lung function 
uh, machine that uh, you're going to they need to blow as hard as they can, they, that you're going to do multiple measurements to ensure that you get the right uh, response before you start. You need to have them sitting, uh, or you can have them sitting or standing. I would strongly recommend that you have them sitting. Some people do get a little bit lightheaded when they do lung function, uh, and so if you have someone who does get lightheaded uh, and they're standing and then they fall over, obviously uh, that's something to be avoided. I would, we always do our testing with patients sitting, and you want to have them sitting reasonably upright. So you want them sitting chest upright, shoulders back, relaxed. Um, you don't want them bent over because that changes the, the position and shape of the chest and that may change their lung function. Uh, when they're doing the blowing, you want their uh, head just looking straight ahead and their shoulders and neck relaxed. Um, it's a good idea to have their feet flat on the floor so that when they start blowing, they're not swinging around in their chair. Um, in some individuals, particularly if they've had any nasal surgery, um, when they blow they may get leak, so the air that they're blowing out may come out through their nose, not through the, the spirometer, and so it's, it's a good idea to use nose clips. Um, depending on the supplier of your filters that you use, you can get nose clips through them. Uh, worst case, every patient comes with their own nose clips, you can just get them to hold their nose. You need the patient, uh, the individual, to take a really big breath into total lung capacity. This does not have to be fast, so they can take their time, and then you want them to have a really big breath in, and then you're getting them to blow out as hard as they can for as long as they can. Depending on the mouthpiece that you're using, you can either do the big breath in and then put the mouthpiece in, and they blow out as hard as they can. And this would be if you're using mouth, um, those disposable cardboard mouthpieces that have a one-way valve, or if you're using mouthpieces that have bacterial filters in them, then you can have it in the mouth before you start the test, and they can just do normal breathing before you start. And this certainly does help them get used to using the spirometer. Um, the other advantage, of course, is that when you use those cardboard mouthpieces with one-way valves, that stops the patient breathing in through the equipment. So that's obviously very important for infection control. So you know that the patient who you measured before isn't going to transmit anything to the patient that you measure next because they can't inhale through the spirometer. What, it, what those mouthpieces don't do is they don't protect your staff from um, any viruses or other um, infection control type issues that the patient may have. So, for example, we know that nearly 80% of asthma flare-ups are linked to respiratory viruses and colds. The patient comes in, they're not very well, they do lung function, and the first thing they do is blow as hard as they can and transmit virus all through that environment. Um, so when we do all of our testing, we use mouthpieces with bacterial filters not only to make it easier for people to do tests, but to minimise the potential uh, for um, cross-infection between patients and between patients uh, and our staff. You then want to get the patient to exhale as hard as they can. You really have to encourage them to blast out rapidly. What you're not doing is saying, big breath in, and now blow as hard as you can and they're blowing away, and then you say, great, you can stop now. I guarantee that if you do it that way, you will get um, very variable responses. You need to enthusiastically coach, get right into it. Think of, think of yourself as being their personal trainer, um, and you need to be verbally encouraging them to continue to blow. You want them to keep their chest upright during the test. You don't want them to start sitting and then blowing over like this because that's going to change their chest. And you need them to blow all the way out until there's no air left. Um, so how do you know if you've got a good test? A test is considered acceptable if you've had a maximal uh, inspiration prior to starting the test, so they're all the way up to total lung capacity. A slow start will influence the FEV1. The end of test is considered to be acceptable if you see no change in the volume for at least one second. So what you're going to see is a plateau on the volume time trace, and I'm going to show you what one of those looks in a minute. Um, 
In some patients, particularly those with more advanced lung disease or severe COPD, they may blow for a very long time. If you've got someone blowing out for 12 to 15 seconds, you don't need to keep blowing, even if they haven't reached the residual volume. At that point, you know that they've got severe lung disease uh, and all you're going to do is really tire them out unnecessarily and going that little bit further isn't going to change uh, how the doctor manages that person's uh, COPD usually. So here's what a good flow volume curve looks like. So I showed you this bit earlier, so the flow volume loop, but what you're really looking for is at the beginning of the curve that there's a rapid acceleration in flow to a peak. So that means, so it's not going over like this, that would be a very slow start, so you want a really rapid vertical acceleration to a peak. You've got a nice smooth decrease down to zero flow at forced vital capacity. Now, when you're doing spirometry, often on the equipment you'll get to look at two curves. You'll see both the flow volume curve and the volume time curve. And what you can see here is this is the beginning of the curve, so they blow up. And what you can see is at the end that the volume comes to a nice plateau. And so you can see here that it's nice and flat. If you see this, you can be um, very certain that th that patient has blown out for as long as they can because they're blow you can see that they're still blowing here two or three seconds and there is no more air coming out. If, for example, they blew to this point and then took a breath in where there's no plateau, then you would have not very much confidence that you've achieved forced vital capacity. You may still have a good FUV1 curve. So how many tests do you need to do? You need to do at least three acceptable manoeuvres. So that's not three tests together, that's three where you know the start of test is very good, so you had a rapid acceleration to a peak, and also that they blew all the way out to residual volume and you have a flow plateau. Current recommendations suggest that if the patient can't do three acceptable manoeuvres, by the time they've done eight, blows, they're probably not going to be able to do uh, a good lung function session for you and pushing them further than that is probably just making them unnecessarily tired and so at that point you could stop. One thing that we need to look at is we need to know not only that they've done three acceptable uh, attempts but also that those attempts are repeatable. So your main job when you're doing spirometry is to produce an outcome where you can confidently say that the lung function that's going on that report is both acceptable and repeatable. And that means that you know that you've got the best from the patient on that day. So a test is considered repeatable if the two best FVCs and FUV1s agree within 150 mils. So that is when you're looking at the test, you'll have all of the numbers, it'll show test one, some numbers, test two, some numbers. And when you look at those two best tests, so let's say that FUV1 was 3.4 was the first test and the second test was 3.5, then they agree. They're within 100, they're 100 mils apart, they're within 150 mils, and you know that those, those are repeatable. Nearly all of the modern lung function systems will tell you whether your test session is acceptable and repeatable. And so you usually get a warning um, test session not repeatable, not enough acceptable blows. And so getting to know what your equipment does and what type of warnings it can give you can help you uh, if you're uncertain in that situation. So some common things to look out for. Uh, inspiration is not complete, so they didn't take a really big breath into total lung capacity. Maybe if they're putting the mouthpiece in, they might start blowing before the mouthpiece gets in their mouth, which means there's some flow and volume that's not being measured. If they have a leak around the mouthpiece, you won't get the right results. Um, they may not have their lips really tight around the seal. Um, if, the expirate, if the blow that they're doing is not really forced, um, or they didn't go all the way to residual volume, then the numbers that you get will be lower than you should get otherwise. And in some patients, they'll, they'll get quite a lot of cough. Uh, and so depending on whether that, where that cough occurs, that may mean that the results that you have are not usable. 
If you have someone who coughs continually and you can't get any measurements without cough, that's okay. Uh, that happens sometimes, and then it's just a case of making sure that you record that that's, that that's what has occurred. So what's normal lung function or what's abnormal lung function? So to know whether lung function is normal or not, you need to know the age of the person, you need to know what gender they are, uh, and you need to know their height. You need to think about what their ethnicity is, and I'm going to talk about this a little bit more in a moment. Uh, and so your system will have embedded in its database uh, the reference values that it's using. And when it produces results, it will produce results like 80% predicted, 90% predicted, it's important to know what predictors uh, you're using. And this is why. So you may be aware or may have heard uh, people talking about, oh, if their lung function is less than 80% predicted, then that means that their lung function is not normal. So this is some uh, quite old data now from the late 90s from America. Um, but what they had is they had lung function from um, nearly 8,000 healthy individuals. So they had no history of asthma, COPD, smoking, or anything like that. And what you can see here is that for any age, so let's pick 35, there is a spread of normal, as there is for anything else. Um, and you can see that 80%, if you're aged between approximately 25 and maybe 40, at 80%, there isn't anyone who has lung function lower than 80. So that means this is below 80% here, probably would mean that their lung function is not normal. However, if you're 10 to 15, actually the lower limit of normal is about 85%. And so someone whose lung function is 80%, if they're 14 or 15, is actually really quite low. Equally, if you're 80% and you're 75 years old, you don't have lung disease, you're probably Superman. Uh, because you can see that here you have all of the people who are approximately 75 uh, and their lung function is well below 80%. And so down here, it might actually be 70%. So it is more appropriate to use lung function reference equations that are just for somebody's age. And so what then you would see is that you would see a red line that runs down with age because unfortunately, like everything else, uh, as we age uh, and develop uh, wisdom lines in our face, as it were, uh, our lungs also start to sag a little bit and so our lung function decreases with age. And sadly, with lung function, that starts happening from about 30 years. Um, so luckily, we can't see that normally. So... Uh, in 2012, the Global Lung Function Initiative released uh, new prediction equations for spirometry that included information on about 74,000 healthy individuals aged from 3 to 95 years. Um, these are probably the best lung function reference equations you can use. Nearly all modern equipment includes this uh, in their databases. And so what we would strongly recommend is that you um, have a look at your systems that you're using. Use your operator's manual to find out how you can check what your reference equations are and see if you have, they'll be called the GLI 2012 equations. See if they're listed in your database and if they are, you can change to those. If you can't see that in your equipment software, then you can contact the people who are the distributor who you bought that equipment from, and they should be able to tell you how you can um, add that in, or whether they can update your software so that you do have access to those equations. These equations have been recommended by both the Thoracic Society of Australia and New Zealand, so that's the medical profession. Uh, of respiratory physicians who look after patients with lung disease by the Australian New Zealand Society of Respiratory Scientists, so they're the people who do all of the lung function testing, as well as nearly all of the other uh, big international bodies. So these are, these are the equations that you need to use. This table just gives you an example of what can occur with different ethnic groups. So when we report predicted lung function, we're really relating 
the patient you have in front of you and their lung function to what we would expect in the general population and that's influenced by their age and their height and their gender. So what you can see here is that if we compare to um, a healthy white person with no lung disease, the average um, Afri African American has lung function that's nearly 15% lower than the average um, Caucasian person. Northeast Asian, so China, Northern Hong Kong, um, only a little bit lower, approximately 3%. Individuals from Southeast Asia, so that would be Vietnam, uh, Southern Thailand, nearly 10 to 12%, and in females, almost 15% different. Now, the reason why this occurs is that if you think about it, if we were to line up um, a group of people like me, so 46 years old, male, 185 centimetres tall, and we had 10 of me who were Caucasian, 10 of me who were from Thailand, 10 of me who were from China, um, and African Americans, we would all look a little bit different. On average, African Americans have longer legs for the same standing height than Caucasian. That means their lungs are a little bit shorter. We would all recognize that often people from Vietnam and Thailand tend to be slimmer, so the circumference of their chest is a little bit narrower than what you would expect in a Caucasian population. So not surprisingly, this leads to differences in lung function. So it's important that you consider that when you're seeing your patients. So here's a lung function loop. Uh, so what you can see here is what you would see on a report. There's the measured lung function there, the predicted for FVC, for FUV1. Um, here's the FUVC, FV, uh, FUV1, FVC ratio, so only 56%. And in this report, you can see the blue curve here is that person's lung function, and the green curve is what would be considered normal. And these uh, little whisker plots here are the normal range. So you can see that this person has lung function below the lower limits of normal. So uh, normally this would be more interactive, and I'd ask you a bunch of questions. Uh, but you know, does this person have normal lung function? Do they have asthma? So in this case, actually not everything that is obstructed is asthma. This is actually my lung function. If you did a bronchodilator response on me, my lung function wouldn't change at all. I don't have any respiratory symptoms. I don't have uh, anything that would indicate that I have asthma or COPD. I, for some reason, have some fixed uh, airflow limitation. But it's important to recognise that you can't be diagnosing asthma or COPD from baseline lung function alone. You have to do a bronchodilator response. And so, just reiterating, you have to do an assessment before and after bronchodilator response. And really what you're looking at is what is the change. So here we're looking at is FUV1 increasing by 12% or 200 mils? Um, and once again, your system will tell you whether they've achieved that or not. Um, if they're using a PMDI, you should always use a spacer. Use this opportunity to um, coach them to make sure they're using their inhalers correctly. Give it to them, say, okay, I need you to give me four puffs. How would you do that? You know, are they shaking the puffer between uses? Are they taking a big breath in and then puffing and or puffing and then taking a big breath in and holding their breath for five or so seconds? And then you can make sure that you're giving them, the, giving them the advice they may need so that they're taking their puffers correctly. So here's another lung function. So this is a person's baseline lung function. If you looked at this, you can see it's well inside the normal range, inside these whisker plots. The predicted lung function is 130, 111% predicted. So super normal, you think, great, this person doesn't have asthma. If I give this person a bronchodilator, what I see is that their lung function goes up by, the FEV1 increased by 16%. It went from 1.64 litres to 1.89, so well in excess of 200 mils. So based on current guidelines, this individual, in fact this is a 13-year-old uh, a girl, has had a significant bronchodilator response. 
If you only looked at her baseline data, you would think her lung function was normal. So it's important to recognise that in some individuals, they may have a significant response to bronchodilators and still be inside the normal range because the normal range is the whole population and really you're wanting to know what is that person's best lung function. Interestingly, so this is when this girl is reasonably well controlled with her asthma and here's another example when she is being, just before she gets admitted to hospital. So now you can see here that her bronchodilator response was almost 40%. Her FEV1 increased from 1.27 to 1.78. That's over half a litre. You know, that's a chalk milk almost. Uh, and so this is a really significant response and gives you an idea of the type of variation that an individual patient can have from when their asthma is reasonably well controlled, so they're probably being adherent to their preventers, to this example when they're not being particularly adherent with their preventers. So just in summary, uh, if you're going to do good quality spirometry, you have to have some kind of quality control program. And as I mentioned earlier, if you're interested in setting one of those up in your own hospital, uh, you can contact the Asthma Foundation uh, and they can put you in touch with me and we can talk about what might work for you. Spirometry results are effort dependent. It is not like an ECG where you're just putting some dots on someone and measuring a result. The patient has to participate, which means you have to get them to do their best effort. You have to make sure you're using appropriate reference equations. There's no point uh, using Caucasian reference equations if you're seeing a series of patients who are from Southeast Asia, for example. You should be measuring lung function regularly. Uh, if you're having patients come in on a regular basis as part of uh, their disease management. And if you're going to diagnose asthma and COPD, then you have to do baseline testing alone is not sufficient. You have to do measurements both before and after bronchodilators. Uh, and that's it for me, and happy to take any questions that you might have. And does anybody have any questions? We have one from Pioneer Health. Should we be doing pre and post spiro on all patients then we do spirometries on medicals? So this is medicals for occupation screens or? Would you like to clarify that Pioneer Health and mute your microphone? I've just unmuted you. Um, you can ask your question now, by now. So I, I guess the, the question was, should we be doing lung function um, both before and after bronchodilators for medical tests? So that will depend what the test is. If it's an occupational screen, so for example, you have someone who's um, applied for a job with Rio Tinto and they need to have lung function as part of their pre-employment screening. Normally in, in those patients you probably don't need to do spirometry before and after bronchodilator. Um, however, it might depend on who the individual patient is. Uh, and so usually there would be um, a referral from the company or the occupational physician in that case. Um, if, if it was for uh, a pre-employment screen, usually they don't have a bronchodilator. However, it might be for someone who has a history of asthma and, for example, they want to get a job in the emergency services. And the question might be, if this patient, if this person who has asthma is well controlled, do they have a bronchodilator response and therefore do we need to be concerned about their risk in this job? So, for example, they want to be fiery. In that case, you would need to do a measurement before and after bronchodilator. I would always advocate, uh, and this is the one time where it's really important that the people who are doing the testing have the confidence but also the permission internally to pick up the phone and talk to the person who's made the referral and just say, you know, you sent me this patient, we've done the lung function test, it's for a pre-employment screen, their lung function is actually not normal. 
we think we should do a bronchodilator response so that you have accurate information. Do you have any, you know, is that okay with you? Would you like us, what would you like us to do? And really get the information from the doctor at the time um, because the patient's come in and seen you, they've travelled who knows how long. While you've got them there, get as much information from them as you can. Better to have too much than not enough. I hope I've answered that question. Any other questions at all? Is it okay to just run a chair? Um, is it okay to do spirochromatry on children to get a good enough result? So um, I've, doing, I've been doing spirometry on children, so as Russell mentioned earlier, um, most of my career has been spent working with children, including at Princess Margaret. Um, we can get good spirometry from children as young as four to five years of age. Usually takes more than one visit. You know, young kids don't always uh, get it first time. Um, if you keep practicing with them, they will get good lung function. Sometimes what you will get is a good FEV1, so they'll be able to do a really hard blow, they'll blow for more than one second, uh, but they won't blow all the way out to residual volume, so you might not get a good FVC, they take in an active breath. If they do that and you can, and you're getting a good starter test, a rapid acceleration to a good peak flow, the peak flow is repeatable, they're blowing out and the FEV1 is repeatable, so that is you've got at least three good FEV1s and the two best agree within 150 mils, then what you could report is that you have acceptable and repeatable FUV1, but that the FVCs are not acceptable. So that means in that case, the doctor could look at the FUV1, you could still do before and after bronchodilator to see if the FUV1 changes over time, but you would need to include a comment on the report that the FVC is not acceptable because otherwise the doctor might use those FVC results. Uh, you would be underestimating it and it might hide that they've got low lung function. So it's really important that if you think that there's something about the test that isn't acceptable and isn't repeatable, that you make a note about that on the report. Any other questions? Keyboard. It does. Um, um, where we work in emergency, um, so I'm just wondering whether it would, if we see the people and we think that they may, you know, sort of have um, require a lung function, should we re we refer them to our coordinator so she can do the spirometry? So that's a, a patient who's come into emergency presenting yes, with. Yes. Okay, um, so depending on how um, severe their symptoms are, what we often found is if we try to do lung function on someone with asthma or COPD, for example, when they first present to emergency, we often got really bad results because they can't breathe, they're not able to take a normal breath in. So to get them to take a really big breath in and blow as hard as they can is a little bit counterproductive. Um, so the question I always, I always asked in that situation is, are you going to use these results to, to manage that patient? Or how will those results be used to manage that patient? So if they're, if they're really wheezy, they've got uh, chest tightness, you know, on auscultation you can hear crackles and wheezes and all the rest of it, or maybe their SpO2 is a little bit low, you don't need lung function to know that they're not particularly well. You're going to be giving them bronchodilators, repeating that, all the rest of it. What you might like to do is, and I guess this is this is the type of um, sort of clinical pathway that you'd want to think about in your in your own hospital is if we have a patient who comes in and they've got a diagnosis of asthma and CO, and or COPD, do we want to get a spirometry from them? Um, at discharge, or maybe in the if they have a follow-up clinic, depending on what your local practice might be. And so then you'll be getting one from them just before they go home, 
um, which will give you some idea about what they were like at that time. Of course, you have to remember that when they've come in, they've probably taken a whole bunch of relievers before they got to you. They'll have been given a lot more while they're there in emergency. And so I would still do measurements before and after a bronchodilator, but of course the caveat will be that they've had whatever they've had beforehand. It might be more appropriate um, to be really sitting down probably with the emergency team and saying, if we see patients with asthma in emergency, how would you like us to do lung function? You know, if they're coming back in one week or two weeks, depending on what the local sort of practice is, do you want them to have lung function at that one week follow-up? Do you want lung function at discharge? And set in a good sort of clinical pathway so that you get every patient um, all of the time. Okay, well, and that's it for the session today. We're just back to finish up. So if you do have any more questions, you're welcome to email them to the telehealth email here at the Asthma Foundation that you would have received information through. Uh, we are happy to pose, put those questions to Graham at another point. Um, but thank you all for your attendance today. And if you could please complete your post-evaluation forms when you receive the email, that would be great. So thanks for your time today and take care. Thanks very much, everyone. Bye -bye. Thanks, Graham. Thank you. The meeting is about to terminate.